maybe we, we wanted to talk about the ways that young singers might look to developing a career in, in professional choral life. And um, maybe if I could lead off with a quick first question, which is, in your experiences working with professional choirs, what, what essential skills do you think about or look for um, in a professional choral singer? Oh dear, that's <laughs> very broad, I know. <laughs> um, I, I think we sh should approach that and come back to it time and again, because um, it's very hard to, I mean, obviously I can say the, the, the few inevitable things like, well, a good voice, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but either there are very few things to say about it, or there are a lot, because <laughs> um, basically uh, it's it's about voice and it's about the mind behind the voice, the personality, and their approach to being part of a of a group of people. Um, but maybe before we go to that, I'd, I'd like to talk about this this whole business of um, choral singing versus singing. There is, of course, no difference, um, but there is a big difference. Uh, usually when you're just singing, you're a soloist, or you hope you are, um, uh, or you might be part of an opera, you know, with other people, but you're there as an individual singer. Um, and quite honestly, I think a lot of singers that I work with trained at some point with that ideal in their mind soloist, opera, uh, you know, and so on. And we have to be careful um, what we say about that, because it's a kind of, it, it depends on the individual, but um, to me, there's nothing more enjoyable than being in a small group of people and singing together. Um, I, I mean, it's always been that way for no particular reason ever since I was a young kid. I mean, literally at the age of seven or eight, um, what I liked to do was to sing, probably not the kind of music I'm doing today, but um, it, it just, it was natural and I loved it. And I did more of it and then I did a bit more. And then eventually I suddenly realized that I'd reached the age of 16, 17, 18. I didn't know anything about anything else. And so fortunately I was going to make my career in music as a singer. Um, and although I studied a lot of solo stuff, and it was very valuable to me. Um, I increasingly got involved in ensemble singing. Um, and eventually that led to my directing the ensembles I was working with, and then eventually um, stepping right outside and conducting uh, slightly larger groups. Um, but it's always been centered on that ideal, which means so much to me, of the sound, uh, and being part of that sound, but the sound of three or four people singing together, or it can be 20 or 30 people, you know, whatever. Um, and this to me is singing just as much as the solo singing is. Um, in fact, most of the professional singers that I work with also do solo work, of course they do. Um, and with one or two of them, you know that that's still what they really want to do. And they're only doing the other stuff to kind of pay the bills or something. And I think that's a shame in a way because um, chamber music is a, is a wonderful way to make music. Um, and in effect, even in an opera, uh, there is an element of chamber music when you're doing a, a, a scene with two or three other singers or with a small group of instruments. You know, it never really goes away. Um, so I, yeah, right. go ahead. Yes. Well, I was just going to say, I think um, things are changing as well in terms of somebody mm -hmm. who might have a soloist's career and maybe they work in opera, but actually mm -hmm. their career is very varied uh, oftentimes and that maybe they work with a professional chamber ensemble, maybe they're doing opera sometimes, maybe they're teaching yeah. and they know that the skill set that might have traditionally been associated with a with a professional soloist career is much more varied and actually I'm finding what what you've said it's all their their professional lives are all the richer mm -hmm. because they've had mm -hmm. chamber experience and actually that is that is really important and for for some actually 
you described uh, that they they were maybe trying to be an opera soloist and they're doing this on the side. And, and what I've seen happen as well, though, conversely, is that they um, start out that way and, and love the chamber professional ensemble so much that they, they change career tech and they find a, a calling maybe there. Absolutely. And also, I mean, some of the best ensemble singers are also very good soloists. You know, the one, as, as you're basically saying, and I'm agreeing, they do not cancel each other out. Uh, they support each other. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I just wanted to kind of approach it from that slightly wider perspective and come back to your question. Um, what was your question? What do you need to do? Or yeah, essential skills, actually, what, what struck me as you talked about it was, I suppose, the development of the voice and vocal quality mm -hmm. and so on, and how that must be for an ensemble singers uh, a very flexible and adaptable thing and uh, wondered what sort of vocal quality or variations upon that you you find that the the best of professional ensemble singers need mm -hmm. well um obviously to begin again with the same word the voice is the thing that matters and it only takes about 10 seconds to know what kind of a singer you have in front of you. And also, I'm afraid, what you think of that. Um, but that's the way it is. You know, you, you have a voice, you want to use it, so you go ahead and do so. And um, so there's not much to be done about that, except that obviously you need to train, develop a technique. But I also think that a lot of singers need to um, get beyond themselves. They are very obsessed with, with you know, what's happening and am I right and, and doing this correctly. And what you really want is to see them communicating. That is the whole point of singing. It's not just to make a lovely noise, but it's to send it out to the people who are listening so that they want to listen and you know, get something out of it. Um, so that, that, that's the sort of starting point. Um, the other thing is, as you have more time with a young singer or a new singer is to, to find out how they work, how they work with me and how they work with the other singers. Um, again, is it just about them in this context or are they actually involved in the music that's going on and the people that they're creating it with? Because that's where the secret lies. Um, it, it's not about me or each individual. Uh, it's about what's happening with all the people involved, whether it's two or three or 15 or 30. Um, and so that is extremely important to me. Um, then there are other things, of course, and people always talk about technique and um, uh, musicality and skills and so on. And of course, all of those are important. And again, they can be sussed out very quickly if, if I want to. <laughs> um, but it's not to, you know, make something, it's not to put someone in a difficult position. Um, I mean, I know what it's like to, to do a, a, an audition myself, but um, we're testing things to find out what we've got here. It doesn't mean to say there's a line where we say yes or no. It's just, a, you know, what is this particular singer about? Uh, what, what's, what's happening here. And although I always test sight reading, not just for the right notes, but as some singers don't always realize for the right rhythms, which is even more important. Um, but it's again, it's, it, that's information I want to have about a singer if I'm going to work with them, um, is their sight reading skill. And if it's not great, but they're still wonderful singers, I'm probably going to say, right, how am I going to work with this person? Will they prepare the music by themselves sufficiently not so that I don't have to spend the whole rehearsal going over the same little things? That's the point about the, the, the skill aspect. Um, it's, you know. it's very interesting yeah. on the, the rhythmic side, actually, oh, well, yes. because uh, rhythm, rhythmically people don't look at sight singing maybe immediately no. at that. But actually, as you say, if you can work with them and rhythmically it's it's solid or it, there, there's potential to develop that really well. 
then the pitch will come with preparation, you would hope, if the person, if the voice is there and so on. So um, I think that's a really good point to make to young singers, you know, look at rhythmic development. Yeah, well, I mean, you could have music without pitches, so to speak, but you can't have music without rhythm. <laughs> and so it is actually fundamental. So I'm always aware of what is the sense of rhythm here and what are they doing with this piece and why um, if, if there's something strange going on. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And then you touched on um, preparation, actually, and I, I just wondered, you know, I suppose you see in all sorts of professional ensembles over many years, varying degrees of, of and, and indeed not professional ensembles, varying degrees of preparation. And I just, um, in terms of an approach to preparation for somebody who's looking to see how involved or how in-depth that preparation should be, I wonder, do you have thoughts on on the kinds of things they should look at in preparing the music and um, any guidance you might have there? Well, it's going to depend a little bit on what their strengths are. For example, if they've got perfect pitch, then they don't need to worry too much about learning the notes. Um, if they've got any common sense, however, they will still study the music so that they don't just deliver a kind of robotic rendition of what's on the page. They actually understand it as music. Um, and that you can do without making a, a single sound. You can spend time just looking at a score um, and, and seeing what's happening with your part. Um, when I'm flying, for example, I always try and take at least one score with me because the, the, the way to, to have a, a good time on the flight is to examine a piece of music in all its and then suddenly you're, you're coming down to land and you've been looking at one piece of music for half an hour or so. Um, so I, 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 and I still do that. I mean, it's not as if at some point you don't need to do it anymore. Um, so having um, skills such as, or, or gifts such as perfect pitch, yeah, that's great, but it still doesn't take away the responsibility to get inside the music and to understand what it's made of. Now, someone who doesn't have perfect pitch, like me, um, has got to challenge themselves to prepare, to, to get to know the music, to get to know the intervals. And it's simply true that the more you do that, the better you get. Um, it's, you know, I've as I've done more and more new music in the latter part of my career, I used to do a lot of early music, um, but it's kind of switched round. But I've discovered also that my skills um, at actually pitching the music in, you know, for myself have improved just because I'm you know, working with uh, difficult scores sometimes. So it really is something that can be worked on and will improve, but singers have to have the faith. <laughs> that it will lead that way and it will. Absolutely, and actually th that, that strikes me as being key then to be the communicative sort of singer you mentioned at the start you know if they yeah. can take care of that preparation they can really yeah. uh, look to their fellow ensemble members exactly and i'm always aware that in fact some of the singers in the groups i work with i know which ones are not the best singers uh, best sorry best sight readers um and i notice that they're the ones who come most prepared because they know they've got to, and they do, and I think they are that they can enjoy the whole thing much more if they've done that preparation. Some singers, I'm afraid, even today, um, think that the rehearsals are the place for doing all that preparation, um, whereas I'm saying no, it should begin before that, um, and then we can take it further. And as I say, it's it, it goes round and round. The more you do that. And, and challenge yourself to do it, the better you'll get at doing it. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I wonder, we've, we've talked rhythm, we've talked uh, pitch, and we've talked sight reading and so on, sight singing. I wondered about language and its importance um, and, and how, how pivotal that can be actually as a barrier uh, to, to, I suppose, uh, efficient rehearsals and so on. Well, um, I think, yeah, it's hard to answer that one because there are so many ifs and buts. I mean, you don't expect a singer uh, in Ireland or the UK or Denmark, where I now live, you don't really expect singers there to uh, know how to pronounce Russian 
or you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, when I was studying music, um, all of, I and all of my colleagues, uh, we had to take uh, German, French and Italian for singers. In other words, it was focused primarily on pronunciation and yet it also involved understanding the language and being able to gradually speak it better and so on. Um, and I found that invaluable, fantastic. I'd already, I mean, I liked languages and I'd already studied two of those three. And um, so it meant that I also progressed further with my understanding of the languages. The problem comes, of course, when you have languages. I mean, I think all singers, if they've got any common sense, will try and get acquainted with the main languages, which are uh, French, well, England, English, Italian, um, German and French. French is the hardest one, even if you speak French, um, because it, it, singing French is somewhat different from speaking it. Things, you have to do things as a singer that you wouldn't necessarily do just speaking. But those, those three or four languages are essential uh, or are expected, I would say. Um, and people would be slightly, oh, you don't speak German or you don't know how to pronounce German. So those are important things to try and put right. But beyond that, I think normally it would be accepted if you're not very good at Spanish or your Romanian isn't quite what it used to be. You know, normally those things are put in the budget. We need to have a language coach for that. Um, yeah. and, and Russian, for instance, I'm sure yeah. if there's in Russian, there might be a, a, a coach uh, relating well, to that, yeah. I, I mean, a few years ago with Chamber Choir Ireland, we went to Russia um, to join together with a large choir over there in Perm, in the middle of somewhere. Um, and there were, I was expecting a choir of Russians about 30 or 40 of them. There were about 60, in fact. So we had a really huge group. And I thought, well, this is going to be such a Russian experience. And then we started singing and uh, we were in Russian uh, and everything sounded totally normal. I mean, of course it did. They were singing their language. And my point is that it wasn't some strange thing. So the hardest thing of all is to sing or indeed speak another language as if it were an everyday event. Um, so even in Russian, there was quite a surprise when I worked with this Russian choir and thought, yes, it doesn't have to sound, you know, like a, a, a film score or something. It's just normal. Anyway, we're getting off the subject a bit. But no, no, I think that's really interesting. And actually, oh. again, I think it's that theme of communication that it's actually yeah. natural communication. And that's some, uh, as much about language. And um, and I think the point you made around um, being able to pronounce it, maybe not having a vast understanding of that language, which will come hopefully in the rehearsal process and the study and preparation. Well, yeah, but... I was going to say, the important thing about understanding the language, even if you don't speak it very well, um, is that so much music uh, takes its cue, vocal music takes its cue from the words itself. The words are not just objects stuck on top of notes. They are, I mean, usually the, the, the melodies um, have been created because of the particular syllables and words. They form the phrases and the, and the little bits and pieces that are inside the phrases. And obviously, if someone sings every word and every syllable at the same level, uh, pronouncing it correctly, perhaps, but meaninglessly, um, then that's almost worse than the other way around, not mm. pronouncing it very well, but at least understanding exactly what's going on. So I'm not saying that they should become experts at speaking a language, but certainly experts at understanding which part of the word is doing what job. And which word in the sentence is the, let's say, the, the, the most important word that the others relate to most? Sounds a bit scientific, I suppose, but it, no, it, I think it's it there. Sense, and every yes. time, yeah, every time I'm working on a piece, especially in a foreign language, I want to know, oh, well, not only this piece is about such and such, but I want to know which word means which bit and why and how does it affect the other words? Yes. yes, of course. And and would you believe we're coming up towards time, Paul? So I um, wanted to maybe round out with a final couple of thoughts. But um, 
what struck me is that we've talked about all the various elements that are involved in uh, professional ensemble singing. And, and a lot of it, I think, is around maybe from what you've said, flexibility and responsiveness and adaptability. Uh, and then, of course, having a baseline of skills that they've built up and experiences. Um, I, uh, but something we didn't touch on is, are there any particular uh, ensembles or types of setting that they might look to work in before working professionally? Or if not, maybe just to, to dwell on that flexibility and responsiveness bit, if that's better, but just maybe some final thoughts there. I would just say that the more the ensemble singing that singers do, um, the better they become as singers and certainly as potential members of a, a professional chamber choir, definitely.